All right. Have you started to dip your toe into trail running or thinking, you know, that you might dip your toe into trail running and you just don't know where to start? Uh, do you want to see if trail running could be a nice complement to what you're already doing as a runner? Welcome to episode 162 on the Healthy Runner podcast, where we help you get stronger, run faster, and enjoy lifelong injury-free running. Today, I have the pleasure of having uh, a repeat guest back on the show who is just a wealth of knowledge. She is the other half of the dynamic duo that is the Insi Inspired Souls podcast pair with Carolyn Coffin, who was just recently on the show in episode 160. Last time Kim was on the show was in episode 108 on the Healthy Runner podcast, and we explored trail running versus road running. So I knew I had to bring her back on the show to tackle this topic of trail running for beginners. Welcome back on the show, Kim. Thank you, Dwayne. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming back. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you because we get questions all the time from runners in our Healthy Runner community about trails. And you were the first person that came to my mind. And I was like, I have just the person who needs mm -hmm. to answer all these questions that people have. So I appreciate you being willing to share all of your knowledge um, that you have about trail running. So just so you guys, so you, you understand the content expert that I have in front of me right now. I'm just gonna give you like Kim's formal bio. Kim Senachal is an avid trail runner and licensed physiotherapist from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. She has practiced and trained in a diverse environments, including the West Coast of, of British Columbia, the Central Prairies of Manitoba, and near the Rocky Mountains of Alberta. While her racing has taken her all over North America in distances from 10K all the way to 100 miles, which sounds very crazy to me. But <laughs> while in Winnipeg, uh, Kim was able to combine her love for running and healing, where she served as the director of the Running and Gate Center and specialized in treating runners of all levels and abilities. Kim has spent her fair time running on roads, but finds her true passion exploring the wild places and spaces that trail running delivers. She is a proud mother of two teenage boys and is currently working for a nonprofit organization. So as you guys can see, I have an expert in front of me here who's going to be able to help you. So in this episode, Kim's going to really provide you everything you need to know to get started with trail running. She's going to get into who should consider trail running, how do you get in shape for trail running, how do you start, and she's going to share 10 specific tips for you to go from roads to trails. Now, Kim, you have a pretty impressive professional resume being a physio, a former or a manager, a former private practice owner, mm -hmm. a speaker, a lecturer, a researcher, like you've done it all. You have like this prestigious running clinic. You added run coaching right to your resume yeah, yeah. and your experience. And then you decided to become a podcast host of the Inspired Souls <laughs> podcast. So I'm curious to really find out if your quite accomplished resume and vast professional experience have changed your outlook on how you view runners or the sport of running. Well, I'm blushing, Dwayne, because you make me sound kind of way more important than I think I am. But no. I, yeah, if there's a few things I'm passionate about, it's it's running and it's healing and it's inspiring other people to explore the world of running. So, you know, how has my professional experience informed and changed my outlook on running and the sport? I've been a, a distance runner essentially almost the same amount of time that I've been a licensed physiotherapist. So I actually think it started in reverse in that I started making all these mistakes <laughs> and I started to recognize the pains that people were describing to me in the clinic because I'd experienced them myself. And so I, my evolution of how I started to treat my clients came from my own mistakes. Over time, my knowledge of, of running injury and, and training and prevention of injury then informed how I trained myself so and my athletes as well. So it really was a kind of a symbiotic relationship. The, the, the feedback loop went in both directions. You know, I did learn as a professional treating runners for, for years that, you know, there 
no two runners are the same. There is no exact right or wrong way to run. There are overguiding principles that can definitely lead you towards more success, but there's many different ways that you can function within those principles. And so I learned not to be too rigid. I learned to seek creative solutions and that's what keeps it fun. I will say that runners often come in and say to me, I don't understand why I hurt so much. I don't understand why this is sore. And I would counter with the opposite. I'm like, we should question why we're not more sore with what we put our bodies through all the time. Our bodies are amazingly resilient, adaptable structures, and they will perform for us until they just can't. <laughs> and so I, I'm always in you know, fascination with the human body and what we can do, not just in the, the rehabilitation context, but in the performance context. So, you know, I guess the final thing I'll say on that question is that I've really come to view, and I always have running as a gift. It's a true gift. You, you see it when runners come to you injured and can't in tears, <laughs> And you appreciate it in your own body when when you can run pain free and strong. It's it's a gift, and I think that is a real privilege for us, Dwayne, as mm -hmm. physical, physical therapists, as podcast hosts, to help people access that gift. Oh boy! Wow, what an answer! And I I just love how it sounds like, and I I, I might be kind of speaking for you, but it sounds like you're stance on how you help runners, right? Or running as a sport has definitely evolved as you've sure. grown yourself as a yeah. runner, as you've grown as a professional. And I can agree wholeheartedly with that statement as well, but I couldn't say it as, as beautiful as you did. So, you know, that's, that's pretty typical though, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, <Shut up>. so, <laughs> so the last time you're on the show in episode 108, I know you kind of shared your why you started trail running. Do you mind just in case someone didn't listen to that, mm -hmm. just kind of give us the the brief rundown of like what made you actually start doing trail running? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, similar to many runners probably listen to this podcast, I was exclusively a road runner when I moved to Vancouver Island, British Columbia. So that's just for those of you that don't know, north of Seattle, Victoria, Vancouver ish area. And you know, it was kind of a little bit by default, a little bit by circumstance and choice, but I did my first road marathon there on the island and I'll be honest, it hurt a lot for reasons that, you know, are varied. Some of it was improper training. Some of it was, you know, it was just my first one, but I was really kind of burnt out from, from the training from that and decided to follow a friend's advice and just go for a short run on the trails with, with her one day. And it's hard to live in a place as rugged and wild as Vancouver Island without running on trails. Like you run out of road and then you have literally hundreds of miles of trails available to you. And so it, it just became one of those things. My friends were doing it. I wanted to explore and do it. I wanted to break from the watch and the monotony of the road. I just wanted to play for a little bit. And then I was essentially hooked, <laughs> which <laughs> led me down the road to eventually, yes, loving to do ultras. But Fundamentally, it was just I needed to relax a little bit. And that's what kind of one of the things I hope to talk to you more about tonight is how trails can kind of provide a bit of variety in a runner's um, life. Yeah, it sounds like fun. I can't wait to hear. So can do you mind just catching us up on kind of what you've been working on this past year in your own training or was there any specific races? I, I've been following your podcast, yeah. so I kind of know, but a lot of our listeners might not know kind of what you've done this uh, this past year. For sure. So yeah, I am an ultra runner. I like runs with the 100 number in them, whether it's 100 Ks or 100 milers. And so <laughs> I, I did uh, uh, the Gorge Waterfalls 100 K last April. It was a really good race for me. It's a qualifier for Western States 100, which many people will know about, even if they're not trail runners, uh, you have to qualify. So I did that one along the Columbia River Gorge in Portland, near Portland, Oregon, and absolutely loved it. Stunning, stunning scenery. Then I managed to sprain my ankle really badly at the very top of a mountain here near Calgary in the Rockies and had to pull out of my next race, which was a 120 mile race in, in British Columbia called the Fat Dog 120. I made it to about the 70 mile mark and then, 
you'll be proud of me, Dwayne. I, I made a judgment call that I did not want permanent injury and surgery, and it was best to just call it. So they're, in fact, on our podcast, the Inspired Souls podcast, we break that down pretty deeply. We called it the anatomy of a DNF. Yes, I listened <laughs> to it a couple yeah. weeks ago and I absolutely loved it. <laughs> yeah, I, I loved it. Deep in the psychology part of it. But yeah, so that was my, my summer. I paced a few friends in races of theirs. So in the ultra trail world, it's very common to have a runner go with you. Uh, through the night or, you know, the later stages of a race where you may not be thinking clearly and need a person to Mm. keep you on trail. So (laughs) I did that. And yeah, it was a good season. I don't, I don't really do a lot of races because my races take so much out of me. So I usually only plan one or two big ones. My next is going to be Canyons 100K in California on the Western States course the end of April. So Oh, exciting. And the ankle is uh, healing nicely. The ankle is now well, is performing well now. Yeah. Excellent. I'm I'm happy to hear that. I know, Mm -hmm. I I know you're talking about like cartilage, chondral defects. Yes. And I was like, oh boy, I hope, yeah, it sounds like it was a really good decision that you had yeah. that you didn't decide to continue. So for those listening mm-hmm. who have ever not finished a race or considered not finishing and thinking about the psychology that goes into that decision-making process and or feeling bad about yourself for doing that, you need to definitely check out that episode on the Inspired Souls podcast. Highly recommend it. Um, but there was a great, um, episode that you guys did. So yeah, let's get into today's topic. And I know you have a lot of tips that, uh, you're going to share with us. So, you know, really looking at how we can start trail running for beginners, you know, if, if someone really never even thought about trail running, um, who should consider trail running? Everybody, in my opinion. <laughs> in your non-biased opinion, of course. In my non-biased opinion, no. But I could stop there, but I think I'll elaborate with, I think we need to go, Dwayne, to what is a trail? How does one define what a trail is? And mm-hmm. I will say for the purposes of this talk, this episode, I'm going to define it as really any natural surface, anything that's not concrete or pavement. So a trail could be anything from, you know, a... an kind of a limestone smooth pathway, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Almost like a ball diamond type surface to, you know, roots and rocks and the Appalachian Trail type experience where there's mud and and rivers to cross, right? So when people think trails, they're sometimes intimidated by, oh, I couldn't do that. Like my ankles would never handle that. A trail doesn't have to be highly technical. It can be smooth and flat. Well, it can be flat, it can be smooth, it can be hilly. But that's why I think anybody can run on trails. Not everybody can necessarily easily run on very technical trails. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. But anybody can run on a natural surface. And in fact, it's really good for your body to do that periodically. Okay. So what do we need to know before we start tackling some trails and trail running? Well, I think the first thing a person needs to know is that they're really fun. And uh, that's why I love running on trails. The second, I only have really three key points here. It's fun. You don't need any special equipment or gear to do it. That's one of the biggest objections people have is I don't have the stuff. I don't have proper shoes. And then you you can just do it. Like it's, it's I'm going to give you some very specific tips and tricks coming here. Mm-hmm. But really the only key thing you need is you have to want to. <laughs> If you want to, you can get it done. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine you might elaborate on this in a little bit, but as you said with equipment, like that is one of the things I thought about, like, Mm -hmm. okay, obviously if I'm on trails, like I must get specific trail running shoe. But as you just mentioned with the different surfaces, if I was starting out on something that was pretty smooth, like one could probably wear their current running shoes, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to go into it a little bit more in detail, you know, soon later, but that's exactly it is that if it's a smooth and non-technical, not slippery, you don't have to worry about sharp rocks. Your regular running shoes are completely fine. 
I like a lower, I mentioned this previously, but a lower stack height um, when running trails, especially if you're starting to get an uneven ground, the closer your foot can be to the ground, the better. But you do need to consider if you are going to end up on sharp rocks, slippery rocks, you may want some more grip. You may want a firmer outsole to protect your foot. But in the beginning, if you're just starting to experiment with non-technical trails, softer surfaces, a regular running shoe that you're wearing on the roads is completely adequate. Okay. All right. Now, what about, are there any things before we kind of go into these tips and what, you know, beginners really need to know, is there anything we need to worry about in terms of like getting in shape for trail running? Like, is there any specific conditioning or exercises that one should consider before going out into the trails? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I would say getting in shape for trail running is the same as getting in shape for any kind of running. You want to do everything that you would normally do in your blueprint there, Dwayne, to to make sure that your body is prepared. But there, there definitely are some things you want to focus on a little bit more that really aren't optional. They're, they're essential. And so the key, the key thing to remember with trail running is it's not a homogeneous, predictable surface that your foot is typically going down all the time, right? You could, you could have uneven ground. So you need your body to be able to react to that and control that and keep the momentum going straight forward. So you want to focus a little bit more or at least mindfully on exercises that control rotation of your body, as well as control the sideways movement of your body. So we call that the rotational and then the transverse plane, or sorry, we call that the transverse and the frontal plane for those that want to get technical. <laughs> so exercises that, that strengthen your core, that strengthen your foot and ankle in multiple different directions. So you want to look at very specific balance agility exercises. So, you know, just to throw out some things, your, your BOSU ball, your wobble boards, your ladders. Think of soccer drills, right? Or football conditioning drills, moving your body in multiple different directions. I really like trail runners to spend a lot of time on one foot. In fact, I like all my runners to spend a lot of time on one foot, but trail runners on one foot, doing things that challenge their stability in those multiple directions dynamically. So you could, you know, stand on one foot and grab a TheraBand or tubing and just pull it to the side, do like a, a shoulder rotation exercise on one foot, right? <laughs> and then not only are you getting a shoulder exercise, you're getting challenging all those dynamic stabilizers of your foot. Pulley exercises on one foot, single leg squats, single leg calf raises. And then as you start to become more confident and stable with some of those more controlled exercises, bringing in your plows. So if you are going to be running in a more mountainous environment or on a more technical trail where you're going to have to jump over a log or you're going to have to react real quickly if a rock starts to slide out from under your foot and you just don't want to fall, <laughs> having the ability to, to bounce, to jump really quickly and dynamically without conscious thought, right, with subconscious reaction is really important. And so that's where some of your jumping, you know, exercises might come in. So I don't know, is that enough detail for you there? Yeah, you no, it, it sounds day? like, honestly, that the principles that we've talked about in the, you know, the spark blueprint that you had referenced, um, and we've talked about in the show here many times before of kind of training on one leg and doing some jump training specific exercises mm -hmm. that are important for all runners sounds even more essential really yeah. for trail runners just because their environment is going to be uneven, right? And there are many runners out there who might be listening to this that you maybe have a history of ankle sprains. Like we've talked about that on the podcast before for you guys who have some ankle instability issues, like it's really important for you to strengthen these muscles. And then if you're going to be doing trails, it's even more important, right? 100%. So it's, yeah. it's even more important to double down on those kind of strengthening principles on one leg and doing some reactive kind of jumping, bounding, like you said, yep. so you're going to be able to react to the environment in which you're in. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. It, Totally makes sense in my mind. 
All right. So I'm excited to get into some of these tips. So how do we get, or how do we really start trail running for beginners? What's your uh, first tip? Okay. So my first tip is to keep it fun and not overthink it. I think we can sometimes get so hyper analytical and maybe fearful of this unknown that is the trail environment. So I would say just start out really creatively. It's winter right now in a large part of North America. So, you know, run in the snow, make a trail in the snow across a ball field. That's trail running, right? In my mind, add in some variety with, with, with your runs as far as speed and hills. And then another way to keep it fun is to take pictures. I love part of the whole, you know, joy of trail running is that you get to go in really pretty environments. If you live in a mountainous or hilly area, often you end up at a summit (laughs) at sunrise or at sunset. So taking the time to just, you know, look around you and appreciate the experience is a great way to start trail running and not getting to set on pace and distance. So that would be my first tip is just keep it fun. Yeah. You must have a GoPro now. Do you have a GoPro? I did. I wore Uh-oh. it out. <laughs> <laughs> I just bought one and they, they seem pretty awesome. I've been playing around with it, but I would imagine that thing is, is amazing to like, just bring with you, like you said, just to yes. check out some of these, uh, the sites and yeah. Well, phones have such great cameras on them now. But yeah, I actually wore a a GoPro during the last maybe two hours of of a race that I did along the North Rim of the Grand Canyon because I wanted to get pictures of what I was seeing without stopping literally every five seconds to take a picture. And uh, yeah, I got some great photos up there. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right. What's tip number two? Tip number two is, okay, we're going to talk about falls. We're just going to jump right in there. And these tips are in no particular order of importance. They were just kind of the order that I was brainstorming. But one of people's biggest fears is that I'm going to trip and fall and hurt myself. And let's be honest, that is the most common running type of running injury in trail running (laughs) is, is the traumatic fall type injuries. And so you do want to take some measures uh, to prevent or minimize that risk of falls. So under subcategories under this tip, here's some suggestions. This is a time to really, really pay attention to your form. And this is where trail running can make you a better road runner. You have to increase your cadence. You should take shorter strides and you need to pick up your feet. If you're running lazily, the trail will tell you and down you will go, especially if there's roots or rocks. So make watch your form. Scan ahead. Don't follow too close in front of the person running in front of you. If you happen to be running with a buddy or a partner, you want to be looking a little bit further down the trail than you typically would road running. And if you're following too closely behind somebody, you're not going to see what's coming up in front of them. So give yourself a little bit of space and heaven forbid they fall, you don't want to pile up. So give yourself a little bit of space. It is really important to stay well fueled and hydrated because lazy, sluggish legs won't be picking up as high, and that's when you will be at risk of tripping. So this this is when I trip and fall. I know when I'm starting to catch. Sorry, when I catch my foot, I rarely fall. But when I'm starting to catch my toe on roots and rocks, I check my fueling schedule. I'm like, is it time for a bar or a gel yet? Because I'm thinking the glycogen stores might be getting low on my feet <laughs> right now in my legs. Sure enough, it's usually around that time I'm due for a snack that I'm starting to catch my foot. So stay on top of that. Don't get behind. Stay humble. <laughs> so it's important to stay, be careful when you're pushing your limits on trails. So if you're starting to work on speed work or, you know, I I tore my hamstring really badly coming off a mountaintop during a race once. And we had been climbing for like three hours and I was just like sick of climbing. I'm a downhill specialist. And I was just like, we got to the top and we start to go down and I pull out to pass the person in front of me because I was cocky. And I'm like, I'm a downhill specialist. Here we go. (laughs) Boom. Down I went. Right. So stay humble if you're starting to get a little bit more experienced with the trails to avoid falling. And then finally, if you do fall, 
Okay, because sometimes it happens. There is a right and a wrong way to fall. <laughs> what you don't want to do is to get very rigid and protective or put your arms out, you know, really far in front of you like a Superman, right? That's where you get what we call a foosh injury, fall on outstretched hands, broken wrists. Um, what you want to try and do is stay relaxed, kind of the tuck and roll. Get your hands under you, get your hands underneath your chest with flat palms, and then just roll is, is usually the best way to fall. That is unless you're on very sharp, sharp rocks, but I think that's a more advanced trail running <laughs> environment for a lot of people. So that was a lot under my second tip, but I think, again, we relieve the fear and anxiety if we just prepare and we think and we prevent how a fall might happen. And so if you follow some of those, maybe you will never fall. And if you do, it won't be catastrophic. Wow. No, that is super helpful because I definitely would not have thought of those on my own. So I'm sure many people appreciate uh, your experience. And yeah, all that makes sense um, as far as the form. And then I would imagine too, you know, not staying hydrated and fueled is prob probably more common, right? Because you can lose track of time easier Absolutely, you can, and stop sure. and take pictures. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, you're just like lost in your scenery and it maybe is so fun. And you're like, hey, this is like an adventure. And then before you know it, you know, it's an hour past when you should have fueled. And if you're on yeah. a road, you would have like known, hey, when I pass this mark, I usually take a gel or I have a snack. Yeah. And I would imagine that's pretty common that people and, and even weather wise too, right? Especially mm -hmm. when it gets hot, I'm sure maybe if you, you're thinking, especially with change in elevation, I would imagine well, that I think would- that's even more than, I mean, it gets hot on roads too, but yes, elevation will, will change how your body metabolizes sugar as well as your hydration. You get more dehydrated at altitude. And um, yeah, I mean, part of the lure of trail running, it is, it is less rigid. You can't assume- you know, you can't go on pace. And so I actually have to set my watch to beep. I set it to beep every 45 minutes to make sure I'm eating on time. And then I set it to beep every hour. So I'm taking my salt pills on time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I don't go by so many miles or this landmark. It's, it's more time-based. No, that's a great, great tip. Um, excellent. All right. What is tip number three? Okay, so tip number three is to start gradually and slowly. And I think this is good wisdom, no matter whether you're running roads, trails, sprinting, long distance, whatever it is. But the three kind of areas that I think you want to be moderate in how you introduce them to your trail running, one is mileage, obviously. I think you should start integrating shorter runs on trails into your weekly run plan or even parts of your runs on trails. So if you have, if you live near a nice trail system, you could start out on the road, hop into the trail for the middle part of your run and end back on the road uh, before you're really tired. <laughs> But definitely don't decide, oh, you know, I'm a marathon runner and I have a 20 mile run on the schedule this Saturday and I'm going to do it on trails. Yeah, not very wise. You, <laughs> yeah. And then the second thing would be moving from less technical to progressively more technical trails. So get yourself used to running on dirt or on, you know, a nice packed chip trail and then eventually add in a less technical trail and tell you eventually introduce more roots, rocks, obstacles, hills. So that would be actually my final kind of start slowly is adding in your hills as well. It's never usually a problem going up. It's coming down for trail runners. So, you know, it's kind of the opposite of the workout. I would recommend maybe running up, but then walking down because if you're not used to running on a technical trail, that's when you could get yourself into trouble. So getting your feet used to, to landing and that confidence <laughs> of how you're going to go down the trail safely. So the three things start slowly with mileage, technicality, and hills. And just for clarification purposes, is it like how I would normally think about going downhill? Obviously, gravity is like taking your body mm -hmm. weight down. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be more demands on 100%. your muscles, yep. your tendons, and there's a greater likelihood that you could get out of control and possibly suffer one of those traumatic falls that you were talking about earlier. 
Yes, exactly. Okay. You know, I'm cognizant of the fact that we probably have listeners on this podcast that live in lots of different types of environments from flatlands to, you know, potentially mountainous environments. And so if you are new to running down a steeper hill, you know, there could be slippery mud, there could be, um, you know, gravelly substances that make you go down the hill a little more carefully could be roots and rocks. But if you you take your time and slowly develop more confidence, you'll find over time you can run those just just as efficiently as you can run on land or sorry, on flat land. Yeah. I love how this kind of start gradually and slowly and kind of progress almost when I think about like our plyometric progressions, mm-hmm. like how we start those uh, that we have like, okay, start on two feet, then go to one leg, start jumping up onto a box before you jump down. Cause that's the yeah. deceleration. Yes, exactly. Very similar to kind of what you talked about with your progression and even mileage, like starting slowly, right. You're not going to like do, you know, five plyometric exercises that are like super hard right away, like just start with some hopping, right? And getting your body used to hopping and just getting off the floor. I love that. Excellent. Yeah, for sure. All right. So what's tip number four to go from the roads to trail? Okay. So my next tip is to give yourself some grace when it comes to how you're measuring the metrics of your run. So you, it's really good on trails to use effort or rating of perceived exertion rather than pace as a target. You will always be slower on trails, always, than you would be on a road. But it can be perceived as being way harder, right? Because the effort level is higher, potentially if you're going up or down hills, or if you're working hard to control yourself on uneven environments. So don't go by pace, go by effort level and give yourself some slack because (laughs) if you're comparing performance of an eight mile run on trail to an eight mile run on road, it's not apples to apples. So that's kind of my, my next tip there. Okay. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And especially if you type a runners out there, right, if you are going to, you know, try a trail, like you have to be okay with maybe uh, lessening the reins a little bit, right? And being okay that, you know, your watch doesn't say for your easy run, 10 minute pace or nine minute pace. And, you know, maybe you're seeing 12s and 13s that you never see. That doesn't mean that the run wasn't as beneficial to your, you know, body from a physical standpoint, Absolutely. your mind yeah. from a mental standpoint, and even your cardiovascular system, right? Mm-hmm. From like an aerobic standpoint. You could be working way standpoint. harder at a 12 minute mile on a, a hilly trail than you would be on, you know, a track. So yep. absolutely. Yeah. Uh-huh. And that actually leads me into my next tip. Where are we on now? Number five? Number five. Yeah. Is that track is not a four letter word. You have to make peace with some walking if you're doing more technical or hilly trails. So back to the the rating of perceived exertion or effort, you want to maintain a relatively consistent effort depending on the goal of your run, right? But if you're going up a hill that's quite technical and you're trying to run it at the same pace that you would run it downhill, you're going to burn out pretty fast. You're going to, you're going to reach that glycogen window in 30 seconds to a minute, and then you're not going to have anything left. And so similar to how a cyclist would bike uphill versus downhill, if you're biking uphill, you're going to change gears. You're going to have a lower resistance, higher cadence. You kind of want to do the same thing with, with trail running. If you're going up a hill or on technical terrain, and sometimes that might actually turn into walking. (laughs) It might turn into power hiking. You might need to do that to keep your heart rate in check. You might also have to do that to keep you safe. Like we just talked about going downhill, but especially as you are starting to explore the trails more, don't worry if you have to walk, don't beat yourself up. It is what it is, (laughs) but I would caution you not to get into a saunter. You want to still walk with purpose. You, and that's why I like the word trek. Like you can mm-hmm. still be moving as efficiently as possible. And that is actually always my goal. And one of my many running mantras is moves, move as efficiently as you can in the terrain that you're in. So, you know, sometimes running might actually not be moving the most efficiently. You might actually be able to pass people power hiking <laughs> because they're trying to run on very technical terrain that you can move over faster trekking. So yeah, think about that. 
All right. And I've even, even though obviously this was not on trail, but even some races that I've done where it was more beneficial to actually trek, as you, as you say, kind of up that hill versus trying to run up the hill Mm -hmm. and, you know, being okay with, Hey, people are passing me. But then when that hill leveled out, I flew right by them because I I can serve some energy that they Mm -hmm. were, they were wasting. So they weren't as efficient as you're talking about. So that makes sense. All right. What's tip number six? So I want to talk about gear now here now. So this, this is a a lot of sub points under tip number six. Although I did say that you don't need any special, you know, gear to run on trails and you really don't, especially if you're just beginning and you're starting to do less technical trails, but there is some helpful gear that I think people should consider, particularly if literally, if they're going a little bit more, remote rural, you know, into bigger parks where they may not be urban settings close by. Some of these tips for gear will keep you safe. (laughs) Some will just make you more comfortable. So we already talked about footwear, uh, wearing footwear that is typically a little bit lower to the ground. If you're on very sharp, rocky terrain, you may want to consider a rock plate or a harder outsole so that you don't, you know, if you have sensitive, you know, the ball of your foot is a little bit sensitive or you don't want to get metatarsal strain, something with a thicker outsole can be beneficial. And if you are running in really muddy or wet conditions, so you might do this say in Florida, or I know the Appalachian Trail is really well known for its wet conditions, a trail with a good drainage, or sorry, a shoe with good drainage is also something to consider. But that might not be the first thing you consider. I don't want anybody to think that you know, the cost of gear and having to buy a whole new set of, you know, everything is necessary to get into trail running. These are just some of the things you might want to think about depending on where you live as time goes on. Yep. Another one is the type of sock. <laughs> so the the anklets that you never, you don't even see above the top of your running shoe that road runners typically wear don't often work well on trails. You want something that's going to keep the small pebbles, the dust, the sand out of your shoe and out of your socks. So at least socks that are, you know, about an inch and a half to two inches above your shoe. So the low ankle socks are really beneficial. Yes, your tan line will show it, but (laughs) it's going to keep you more comfortable. If you are running in an area where there might be branches that scratch you or poison ivy or poison oak, you may want to consider like an actual compression sock, like a nice knee high sock when you're running on trails. And If you're running in a place where there's a lot of like small pebbly sand, you may want to consider even a gaiter, which is just a very low, you know, this is not like the hiking gaiters that come way up to your knees. I'm talking, they're almost like a buff for your foot (laughs) and, and they wrap around the top of your shoe to kind of keep the junk out. So that, that's a little further down the line, but at minimum, you want to bring the sock height up a little bit. Okay. No, that makes sense. Yeah. The next thing is a GPS watch or a cell phone that can help you navigate back if you get lost. (laughs) So, you know, a lot of the garments, you can leave a breadcrumb trail on them now. It'll help you get back to the starting point. A cell phone will help you do that as well if you you know, use different apps. But the reality is I've gotten lost three miles from my house in a trail system that I got so turned around. I was in there for like 25 minutes going, how do I get out of this elbow in the river? I keep going around in a circle and I can't get across this blinking river. So it happens, right? So if you, you want to kind of have a way to, to know how to get yourself back and a way to call for help if needed. Are there ever issues with like getting signal on some trails? Absolutely. Depending on where you are, for sure. Yeah. But this is one of the nice things about the Garmin or apps like All Trails is you can download offline maps and then it will still show you based on GPS where you are on that map. Oh, nice. Very nice. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I I, I do have that feature on my Garmin, though I have not used it yet. (laughs) But our coaching team tells me that it, it can get you back wherever you yeah, want to go. It's really sweet. In fact, I had, you know how you can set your Garmin up with different screens that show depending on which type of run. So I have mm-hmm. a road run setting and I have a trail run setting and on the trail run setting, I have the map function and it shows me exactly where I am. I don't bother with it on the road runs, you know, right, functions. Right. 
straight line out <laughs> square or whatever I'm doing, right? But on the trail, it can be, I just used it yesterday. I was doing a big lollipop loop and I wanted to make sure I was coming back on the same trail that I went out on. And so I just pulled up the map function and yep, yep, I'm going back over top of a line that I've already made I'm oh, nice. on the right trail, right? Very nice. So yeah, that can be nice to have. Not essential, but nice. A whistle is really important. And you might think, why? <laughs> if you are in a more rural setting, a whistle can scare away wildlife and it can also signal other people if you're stuck on the another side of a valley or something and you need help. But even in urban areas, it can be really important for safety, you know, because humans can sometimes be more scary than animals <laughs> on the trail. So just a whistle to alert or to scare people away is important. Brightly colored clothing during hunting season. And you might think this is such an odd thing to put on the list, but again, I've run in a lot of different environments, close to town, far away from town. During hunting season, you wanna be very visible if you're out there on the trails. You always wanna pack an emergency blanket and extra snack. And again, you might think, well, I'm only gonna run three miles on the trail, or I'm only gonna go to somewhat of a, controlled environment. Anything can happen on that trail. If you happen to be running in the evening and the sun setting and you sprain your ankle, you have to be prepared for the worst case scenario of what if I have to sit here sweaty, shivering for two to three hours for somebody to come find me and get me out of here, right? So an emergency blanket is really, it's light. It's, it takes no space and is one of those utterly essential items that I always recommend for a trail runner to take. The extra snack should be pretty obvious. What if you have to sit there for a little while? Mm -hmm. A small first aid kit is really helpful <laughs> for abrasions and cuts if you should fall. So I usually pack a couple band-aids. Yeah, really, it's usually just a couple band-aids, something that can keep the blood from flowing if, if you need to. Now, sorry, Kim, let yeah. me just so even for short runs, like when you go mm -hmm. on a short run in the trail, are you always wearing a vest that has like the blanket in it? How do you carry a blanket? Yeah, that's a great question. That was actually the last thing on my list was a small running vest to carry all this okay. stuff. So <laughs> yeah, you know, and again, I don't want this to be a barrier, you know, like, oh, I can't afford a running vest. A little hip sack, you know, the, the belts, the hydration belts that you wear, something that you can carry a few of these key essential items in is I think really important. And yes, Dwayne, I do. I have my running vest with me at all times and that stuff is in it always. Even when I'm running an urban trail, I have that stuff with me. I've gotten into situations where I really wished I had had <laughs> something. So it, it's also extra training, I guess, to have a mild bit of weight on your back, but these mini first aid kits weigh nothing. An emergency blanket weighs nothing. Right. A whistle comes typically built into a running vest, but you could easily put that into a hip, you know, a waist band as mm -hmm. well. So again, you don't have to necessarily have everything I have in this list every run, but these are some of my essentials that I just always have gives hey. me confidence, right? And again, the number one thing people barrier to the trail running is usually fear for people. So if you if you have if you know you're prepared, you know if you know that something might happen, you could be fine for 2 or 3 hours or longer out there while somebody comes to get you out if you sprain your ankle, then it just it relaxes you a little bit more. Yeah, I so, can yeah. probably create a top 10 list of products and items out there that are a lot of runners are buying that are a waste of time and don't do anything. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. everything that you listed <laughs> seems like almost essential to me. So I think, you know, yeah. th this stuff is, is a lot more important than half the other things that most runners are, are spending them money on or, uh, you know, trying or bringing with them. So yeah, this yeah. is, this is very helpful. Well, and this leads into my next topic, which is safety. But I think the final help, helpful gear, and I would almost consider it also, I'm going to say an essential item, is a headlamp. So, and again, way when you might need to take that headlamp with you. But one thing runners don't realize is it gets dark a lot earlier on a trail than it does on an urban street. You don't mm -hmm. have city lights. You've got trees that shield the sunset from going down. Sometimes if you're in a mountainous or hilly area, the sun goes down behind the mountain earlier than you would expect. And 
as I already mentioned, it often takes you longer on a trail because you are going slower than you might necessarily predict. And so how many times have I, I personally been caught out on a trail later than I expected and it's getting pretty darn dark <laughs> and I'm starting to get worried about how I'm going to get back without a light. I've even had to pull my cell phone out and use that light a few times. I'm not proud of it, but I have. And so, uh, you know, again, headlamps are cheap. You can get super tiny ones. You can even just get a little pen light or your cell phone light, some form of light source with you if you're going to be running at a time when you expect that darkness might be approaching is important. Obviously, if you're not out there during the middle of the day, it's not an issue. But if you're pushing dusk, that's that could be a, a safety thing for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and yeah. I would... I would imagine, uh, are you familiar with like the Knox gear light up vests mm -hmm. with all the yes. colors and yes. like, I'm sure that would be great on the trail yeah. as well. Like it's great for us runners on the road. So the car see us, Yeah, absolutely. but they actually just got a, a lamp that goes on your tracer where it's like waist height, which oh, is pretty neat as well. Amazing. And it just, yeah. yeah, it lights up everything in front of you. So for the road, like I absolutely love it because it's a little, and I don't feel like I'm blinding cars as much than mm -hmm. I was with my headlamp. Mm -hmm. Obviously, in the trail, you don't need to worry about that. But for no, those. No, but waste lamps are, sorry to interrupt you there. Yeah, waste lamps are amazing for that reason. They're nice because if you look up or down and you're changing your vision, you're not moving your headlamp, right? Right, right. A hat doesn't affect waist lamps. So I have to yeah. often remember, oh yeah, turn my hat around so I'm not blocking half of my light with my brim of my hat. So absolutely, waist, waist lamps are, are good if that's something you have available to you for sure. Yeah, and those are, those are super um, easy, like the Knox here one for those that have Knox here vests. If they haven't tried the, the lamp yet, I would highly recommend it. They will actually be, they've been a sponsor of our podcast for forever but they're going to be sponsoring this episode. So a little plug oh, awesome. that you guys could get 35% off uh, using your Healthy Runner code. All right, so let's get awesome. into tip number yeah. seven. Seven, yes, yeah, safety. <clears throat> Again, another beefy tip here. I'm going to go over a few things. So back to if you plan for it, it becomes less scary. The reality is, is things can happen on in a city, under a bridge, they can happen on the trails. But these are some of the things you want to consider on a trail for safety. Always tell somebody where you're going, check in and check out, or out and in, okay? That's pretty important. Know your route. So you can do that by printing a map. You can use All Trails. I love All Trails. It is an amazing app that has just about every trail anywhere. I've ran all over North America with that app and things are very accurate. You can download offline maps on all trails. The free version is still very robust. You get a lot of great maps with, with all trails. So know your route. Run with a buddy. If, if you're a little bit nervous or anxious, it's more fun with a buddy as well, but also more safe. Don't leave people behind at major forks. So if you're running with a group and there's people who maybe don't know the route as well or are a little bit less confident, don't let them get lost. Make sure you regroup at all the major forks in the road or in the trail so that um, people are taken care of. And if you do find yourself alone or lost, <laughs> When in doubt, my rule is take the path most traveled. So if you're at a fork and you're like, oh, I don't know which way to go, the, tr the, the trail that looks like it's the most worn is probably the one you should go on. Even if it doesn't get you where you want to go, it will get you somewhere major where there's a map or a, a checkpoint or a, you know, a, a spot that you recognize. Plan for the unexpected when it comes to safety. So we already talked about a lot of the key gear. But you might even want to, if you are allergic to bees, take your <laughs> take your EpiPen, take your meds. Mm -hmm. uh, if you tend to have sprained ankles, you can carry like a mini roll of tape or, you know, just some of those things that you, you if, if you have an area that you're a little bit anxious about, plan for that. Next point there is be aware of your surroundings. <clears throat> so again, this is also very important on roads, but I think it's even more important on trails. Be aware of predators, okay? Bears, you know, um, even 
so bears, cougars, obviously, if you live in those areas, but even humans, I'm actually way more nervous encountering people on the trails that I didn't expect who, you know, may surprise me around a turn or people that have made me feel a little bit nervous than I have animals. Animals are typically run away from you. <laughs> uh, there's, I won't get into it now, but there's ways to, <laughs> to posture and to yell and to grab a stick and look big if, if you encounter an animal. But the more aware you are of what's around you, the less likely you are to become yeah, a problem. <laughs> we'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so be aware. And then that leads to music. Okay. So when I'm on the trails, I don't like to run with two earbuds in. Okay. I like to run either just with one or with like the, um, the aftershocks, mm -hmm. the, uh, those, those earbuds yes. or not earbuds, but they vibrate through your jaw. And that way I can still have my podcast or my audiobook or my music going, but I'm still completely able to hear if a bike is coming up behind me, if, if a runner's coming up behind me, if there's a rustle in the bushes, it helps you to be more aware of your surroundings. And then finally, actually, there's two more things under safety. Am I talking too much here, Dwayne? No, the, this is like fantastic. I'm I'm taking notes, by the way. <laughs> I'm like literally listing this out because this is, yeah, this is literally like everything you need to know as a beginner. So I'm sure this is going to be super helpful for folks. Yeah, I hope I'm not giving anybody anxiety with some of these safety tips. It really is just, again, being aware and being prepared. So... I actually took and at the Running and Gate Center where I worked in Winnipeg, we actually hosted a self-defense for trail runner workshop. And one of the things that came out of that workshop and I thought was brilliant and I'd like to share it is we had a city park quite large. It was probably 5K across, you know, in a square. So running around it, you could get a good 15K run in. So 15K, 10 mile-ish run in. Mm -hmm. And you could access that park in multiple different ways. But once you were in, it was trails. Like you could get disoriented in this park. Lots of trees, trails. Mm -hmm. And the lady mentioned, she said, when you go, know, this comes back to knowing your route. If you're worried about encountering people, for example, on the trails that you wouldn't necessarily want to encounter, your safest exit from any point on your run isn't necessarily back to the start. So say you're moving through your run and you're like, okay, if I encountered somebody on this trail that I really, I needed to, you know, get away from quickly, the next safest place might actually be completely the opposite direction of where you were going at a store that was literally only half a mile away or something, right? Mm -hmm. So just kind of being aware if you are in a kind of an urban trail environment that your safe spots, think about them in advance. You know, there's a convenience store here, there's a parking lot here, and my car is over here in a triangle. So at any point in my run, if I had to bail, what would be my quickest exit to a safe place? Mm. And I thought that was really smart. And I actually went through that exercise with a few of my running routes in the city. And it was kind of eye opening. It was like, yeah, my instinct would be to run back to my car as quickly as I could. That would be the longest way from this right. point in my run back to a safe spot. <laughs> It'd be much quicker to just hop the tracks. And I'd be over near my friend's house that's over here. Right. So, yeah. And I guess I'm kind of going all over the place here, but back to maybe animals on the trail is make noise. Don't be afraid to talk loud, hoot and holler. If you happen to be a little bit more rural and you're worried about, you know, some bobcat or something, I'll, I'll just be yelling, yo bear, <laughs> blowing my whistle. Or, you know, if I'm a friend, we'll just be chatting away. And, and that's another great way to keep you safe. So those are my top tips for safety. Okay. Yeah. And do you, so have you had any close encounters with animals? I have. Do you want me to share? Yeah. No, <laughs> Not to scare, scare everyone scare off, people. but <laughs> <laughs> No, I um I wouldn't say close. I I have seen a cougar. It was maybe quarter mile ahead on the trail, but again, we just made a lot of noise and it ran away and we changed our route. We didn't keep going that same way. We we went back home. I've seen multiple bears, lots of black bears. The only time and bears don't they don't want to be around you any more than you want to be around them. I'm speaking about black bears specifically. Mm -hmm. The only time I kind of got nervous was when I saw a mother with two cubs 
on the other side of a ravine. And the last thing I wanted to do was get between her and the cops. So again, I changed my route. But that comes to being aware. Like I, I couldn't be head down, you know, like totally right. zoned out into my audio book. I was watching and looking around me as I was running. Yep. I was tracked by a cougar once, but that that was actually the only reason I knew is because it was snowy and I could see the tracks. But that was one time where my instinct was to run back to my car, which was the longest way back. I would have been much better to go the opposite direction. And so thinking about these things in advance and how you would react, I think, is is important. Yep. All right. Well, thank you. No, that's super helpful. Yeah. All right. So w- now beyond safety and safety first and mm-hmm. planning, what else do we have for uh, tips if we're kind of transitioning from road to trails? Okay. Well, I only have three left. This yeah. last one, I guess, isn't a huge tip, but it's it's in the theme of being prepared. Be prepared for weather and the environment. So this is almost more for comfort. There's a lot more bugs in the trails. <laughs> So you might want to bring, you know, make sure you put bug spray on before you go trail running. Um, you, if you are going to be in bear country, pepper spray, bear spray is is an important item to think about. Uh, maybe even an extra jacket, you know, especially if you're running up up elevation or, you know, in, in um, terrain that has a lot of variety. Weather systems can change depending on the length of your run. If your run is, you know, two miles, it might not be an issue. But if you start to go a little bit longer, you might want to be carrying different clothing for the different weather. This um, is probably a dumb question. Uh, So my apologies in advance, but I cannot be the only person thinking this uh, who's listening to this. The pepper spray and bear spray um, is to like spray at the bear. It's not yes. like to put on your yes. body to like no, no, it's have to an spray odor at the that bear. keeps them away. Okay. All right. Just so want to make actually, sure. <laughs> it's not a dumb question, Dwayne. And, and this actually brings up another important point. Pe- bear spray and pepper spray is not a joke. It is, if it does get on your body, it's, it burns, right? It'll burn your skin. It'll burn your eyes. And so you want to make sure that if you are going to carry it, you're carrying it securely. I, if I carry it, I carry it in my running, my Solomon running vest where the water bottles go in the front. I have one side, I put the, the uh, bear spray there, but there's a lot of races that used to require bear spray in certain areas. And they now don't because they were finding people were more often accidentally deploying the bear spray on themselves (laughs) than they were on bears. And it was creating more of a, a runner hazard than it was worth. Oh my goodness. So we, you know, again, I think that's a comment that probably only people who live and want to explore in really deep wildlife bear country need to consider. But it's something I thought was worth mentioning. Okay. All right. No, thank you. All right. What's tip number nine? Number nine. Okay. This is this is almost a more fun one. Because trails, if you are going to go and seek out a trail that's maybe new to you, will often be away from your house where you have to drive to the trailhead. We all know how important it is to replace that running fuel that you've just burned within that 30 minute window after a run. And so pack snack. Make sure you are packing your snack and leaving it in your car for after your run because it will probably take you a little bit longer to get home after a trail run than it would just running from your doorstep on a road. So I can't tell you how many times I've been ravenous by the time I got home because (laughs) I forgot to pack my energy balls. So there you go. Yeah. And then yeah. you're hangry and then oh, no one wants yes. to be around you, right? Yes. <laughs> and then you're not running well the next day because your muscles are not recovered properly. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You've delayed that recovery. Not good at all. That's like, so, you know, as we already know, I, I have not tried the trails yet, but it, you're really pitching me hard <laughs> with this. This sounds like fun besides the whole bear thing uh, and getting tracked by oh, a cougar. See, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Even, but the thing is you can have tailgate parties back to this pack of snack thing. It's very common to have trail runners after a trail yeah. runner that just pulls out their snacks and you have a little mini potluck after a trail run I like uh, it. because nobody wants to wait till they get home to eat. So yeah, yeah. I can get down with that. But it reminds me of when I go to a race and I know, hey, it's going to be a long drive back. I'm mm-hmm. putting stuff in my car because I know right? I'm going to be hungry and then I'm going to delay the recovery process. So if you are 
you know, running on trails, especially, it's important to think about that and to plan it in, in advance and put it in your car. Yep. All right. Last but not least, number 10. Okay. Number 10 kind of loops back to number one. It's relax and dance with the trail. And I, I really... I want to pull back from some of the technical aspects and just get to the overall feeling of why I love trail running so much. And Dwayne, I know you're a dancer in at least you were in a past life. And I yes. kind of wanted to just, if I may, read an excerpt from a blog post that I did a while back called The Art of the Dance when it comes to trail running. I would love that. Because I think it speaks a little bit to, to technique and form as well as to the art of it. So... When I first started trail running, I, I'll just paraphrase a little bit here. I attacked the sport. I entered races called gut buster, right? Or perseverance trail run. And everything was like a hundred percent up and then a hundred percent down. And I'll admit for a, quite a period of time, it actually wasn't fun. And this is amazing to me because now I'm so passionate about this sport, but it wasn't fun. It was work. I was spitting blood after every race. Like it was crazy. <laughs> and I was like, there's got to be a better way to do this. I could have tolerated, but, and I even had a few podium finishes, but I still didn't really like mountain or trail running. And it wasn't until I stopped pushing and started working with the mountain and the trail that I fell in love with it. So when I read back over some of the things I've written about my best days of running, dance metaphor keeps popping up over and over. So from a woman's perspective, a great dance partner leads you confidently. You can relax and flow with the dance as you match your partner step for step perfectly in sync. When you and your partner apply just the right amount of pressure against each other, you move as one and create a beautiful picture of human movement. And I know this is easier said than done. I'd like to suggest that trail running well executed is the exact same thing. The mountain is your partner or the trail, and you need to work together. As I talk with my running friends and the athletes that I coach, often hill training, for example, is met with dread <laughs> and races of elevation create anxiety. I've watched so many people attack a climb as if they have to beat it into submission <laughs> or they lean <laughs> way too far back on their heels on a descent, fighting that pull of gravity down the mountain or the trail. If you push too hard against that climb, it will push back. If you resist the pull too much as you descend, it will pull harder. If you commit too heavily to a step that isn't quite right on a gnarly trail, it will drag you down. You need to match your partner step for step, reacting quickly to stay in sync as the path leads you along. If you don't start dancing the dance the ground wants you to do, you'll either blow up on a climb, trash your quads in a descent, or trip and fall, which is not enjoyable it's not pretty and it's definitely not art. So my, um, my, I think challenge to you is if you would like to start trail running, dance with the trail, flirt with the trail, have fun with the trail. Don't overthink it. Don't overcommit, stay light and just enjoy it. Oh my goodness. I love that. I love that so much. And you make it sound so enticing right? We all want to go out on the trails now, don't we? <laughs> Those that are listening, don't you just want to go out and dance with the trail, right? And just have some fun. And it, it just reminds me of being a, a kid again, right? Yep. And I think us as yeah. adults, as many, you know, people listening to this, probably like me, adult onset runner, and, you know, you get into running a lot of us just to, you know, stay healthy or lose weight or get in shape, do cardio, right? And it, like you said, it's it's work. It's like, you know, you got to like work hard, sweat hard, burn calories, but actually like enjoying being out there in, in, you know, I, it's tough for me to ever run on a treadmill, um, myself. So I like being outside, but just everything that you describe about the trail. Yeah. I, I, I know I will definitely explore it. You, yeah, and I'm not sure. A long time there, I know, Hey, it's been a year. <laughs> it's been that long. <laughs> hey, I had like okay, marathon goals true. this past year, yeah, right? Okay. <laughs> but that's I, fair. The, I, I know I, I definitely will. I definitely will. And I, I just love how you describe that like a dance. And, and I could see a lot of fun and joy coming out of it. And I'm sure those that are listening that have. Um, run on trails probably agree with you wholeheartedly and they see you know the the amazing benefits of that so as we come into the final stretch here 
you know, if you could change one thing about the misconception about getting started with trail running, what would that be? Well, despite all the talk of wild animals that I just did, I would say it's not dangerous. It's not something you need to fear. You just need to start gradually and prepare for it, just like anything else that you would do that's an an unknown thing to you. So trails can often bring fear, doubt, and anxiety to people, but the only way to counteract that is to, to just start and be prepared. And Kim, I have no doubt uh, there's going to be many listeners who want to hear more from you. Where is the best place that they can connect with you? Well, the best place is probably our podcast, Carolyn and, and myself's podcast called the Inspired Souls Podcast. That's inspired and then souls with an S-O-L-E-S available wherever you find your podcasts. I'm on Instagram as Flying Phalanges One. So that's the word flying and then phalanges, P-H-A-L-A-N-G-E-S, which are your fingers and your toes, <laughs> the non-physiotherapist out there, the digit one is my handle on Instagram. And I'm also on Facebook if you want to find me there. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kim. This has been such a pleasure catching up again, just like it was with uh, Carolyn. And like I told her, we definitely need to make this an annual uh, occurrence. And who knows, maybe the next time we do this, I can say, Kim, you know what? I've went on a couple of trail runs. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to hold you to that. You were, you were graciously a guest on our show not a while back. And I definitely agree that it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Duane. And uh, we're going to have to do it again sometime soon. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, your expertise and all that knowledge um, and experience um, with the trails. This is going to be super helpful uh, for those starting out. And thank you guys, the listeners, uh, whether you're catching this on a run right now, listening to the podcast or watching the video version on our Spark Healthy Runner YouTube channel. I appreciate all of you guys so much. And as always, let's maintain a strong mind, a strong body, and just keep running. Until next time.